Kirsten, welcome. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today, particularly after all these months uh, where we had to keep distance and we couldn't see each other very much because of the pandemic. It's a pleasure for me to be here because it means a lot to me to speak about the signification of human rights in visual arts. This is always something to reflect on. And as we always say, Anna, together, um, art is always a product of the time, the current time. So the feelings, the fears of people. And you even can tell in the 14th century, Middle Age, the plague, the Spanish flu in 1918, and right now today, the First, Second World War, we have so many sculptures, paintings, words on paper that I could, see, that I could quote right now. Uh, we could spend hours with this. And yes. uh, I think it's so delightful. I'm really very glad and thankful to be here. Likewise, honored <laughs> as always. So, as you know, uh, medicine, and I'm a medical doctor obviously, so this lays very close to my heart. Uh, medicine is a human right already since 1948 in the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25. It's clearly stated that health and best possible uh, well being is a human right. Uh, which leads me a little bit to the intersection between art medicine and, uh, and human, human rights. Uh, particularly now in these COVID times, uh, it has become more and more apparent uh, uh, how important it is, particularly also since we couldn't go for months to museums. And a lot of work, uh, also research studies, show that art is healing, mm -hmm. art is important. And there was also right uh, a few months ago uh, an article, very interesting article, about how important it is for medical students to early on also learn about art and humanity so that they become more sympathetic, sympathetic uh, doctors. But art has also been very important in shaping politics shaping the public opinion on medicine and, and, and healthcare. Can you tell me more about that? Oh, with pleasure. It's a very essential sector. And I do agree, uh, this intersection between medicine and art used to be always significant. Especially for me, I have to say, because I'm a daughter of a surgeon. My brother, my sister-in-law, they are pathologists. So it would always place this discussion, this discourse between us, uh, what is the signification of representation, for example, of the Anthony, Anthony fire? Mm -hmm. You remember that people were horrible injured and they had that ergot um, problem. And um, I brought something, the uh, very important retable de Matthias Grunewald, um, one of the most overwhelming and most expressive paintings in the 16th century, showing us Jesus Christ suffering. And you can see that on his skin, we have the typical characteristical, um, how can I say, um, scars, sort of. <clears throat> and uh, they encouraged, so those paintings, they encouraged people suffering from, for example, the Antony fire. And I really think um, to make it visible, mm -hmm. the fears, the anxieties, and ex exactly with this function right now of this retable, that shows us pretty well how important it used to be all the time. So really, art was healing all the time long. And of course, we spoke about uh, many other artists, and I will give afterwards um, some examples, because there are thousands, and we have to focus a little bit. Um, but to come back to this discussion, I do agree. Um, I always think that surgeons or internists, uh, whatever you name it, um, they have a special kind of um, perspective. And whenever I have guided tours, for example, um, with uh, students, medicine students, yes. I'm always astonished about the way they interpret. So I like it, I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, that's, that's really great. Um, also in terms of epidemics and pandemics, in the history of the world and the history of health and, and medicine, what kind of artists could you name that have been, uh, have been involved in, in shaping public opinion and, and showcasing uh, pathologies, epidemics uh, in the history? I really have to focus because there are a lot of, you could imagine. Um, to start with the Middle Age, in literature, of course, it's Boccaccio's De Camarone. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, in literature in the 19th century, of course, Promessi Sposi di Manzoni. In the 20th century, Alberta Müller-Best. 
and so on and so on and so on. Um, I just named the few. In visual arts, of course, we have uh, painters like Arnold Böcklin. You think about the four uh, apocalyptic horsemen. The War is the title of it. Wonderful, expressive painting in the Kunsthaus in Zurich. Or the pest, actually, at the end of the 19th century, remembering us Bombay that moment, because the pest uh, was horrible at that time. And the way he interpreted that, you can see that with me in the Museum of Fine Arts in Basel, the oldest um, collection open to a public. And that was also very interesting for us, being right now back with the people in a guided tour, speaking with them about the past of Arnold Böcklin. Of course you could imagine, you can tell how they react. And so we had a, a middle age, like a 19th century, and in, in our days, of course, there are many, many artists who are exactly showing us um, pandemic, um, pandemic, bottom epidemic things. It's really bothering me a lot, I have to say, because actually the fact what an artwork may do is to affect you, to touch you. And that's exactly with those artists I named Mira de Monbensi and some other artists. Um, they've done it pretty well. Yeah. Well, this is precisely what we have been experiencing in the past months since the COVID. We couldn't really go to museums, we couldn't go to theatres, and so there was a total lack of interaction, but also these emotions and feelings uh, that art can bring into our lives. So I'm very happy that it's slowly, slowly opening up again. Yes, indeed. Um, I have to say, um, we weren't there at home and doing nothing. We made a lot in the Museum of Fine Arts, for example, in Basel. We always had those online guided tours. And we have to say we had such a positive reaction. I was very happy and glad to see that. And of course, uh, you need to have a, a lot of commitment to do this. But at the end, uh, I can say it was actually uh, the fact that um, people were uh, not anymore thinking all the time on the pandemic reaction. So for example, one reaction used to be uh, of an acquaintance of mine, Dear Kirsten, I'm so happy to see you. Of course, it's not the same as seeing you in a real analo guided tour, but sitting at home, um, looking to you, watching your explana uh, explanation, interpretation, that gives me hope. And that was exactly what we thought. That was the purpose of it. And um, as I prepared our interview, I spoke with Dr. Peter Matthias Reus, who is the German ambassador of UNESCO. So UNESCO and you, you are doing the best job ever today. It's such an impact, of course. And he told me always, don't forget, culture, and this is the Article 27, the freedom of sharing um, culture. Everybody has the right to share that and how important it is. Um, it shouldn't be a luxury product, but everybody should participate on it. And it was really interesting to speak with him, just to prepare, for example, our dialogue today about the signification of it. So it's actually also human right. Yeah. That's also the intersection, which is quite, quite interesting. That's it. And uh, who is uh, currently also, as an artist, involved um, in, 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 in uh, or, or showcasing anything that has to do with this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic? Is there anyone really that's showcasing and trying to shape public opinion through through art and through... Just imagine, this morning I just asked it myself because we are always wondering about Eddie Adams, for example, look at Dalai Lama and Elie Wiesler. I'm so glad to see them here. I think speak truth to power. That's absolutely amazing how this photographer represented to it. But to come back to your question, I wondered, is there really an artist who is representing, I'm sorry, the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. And could you imagine there is? Of course, it's no surprise. Huh? And his name is Andreas Furtwängler in the south of Germany, Baden-Württemberg. And he just said, I don't want to sell those products. I don't want to sell those sculptures made by steel. But to remember that this horrible virus um, so we suffered um, because of that and not to forget it and it is huge like that sort of yeah right it's not nice to see it not at all right. <laughs> Well, I remember I used to do a lot of research, uh, and in our labs we sometimes took pictures of our cells, cell cultures, fluorescent uh, genes, and uh, fantastic artwork, which we thought at least was fantastic. <laughs> are there are there pictures, photographs uh, that have have emerged that uh, 
one should be aware of? This is really a very important question. Um, you remember my doctor father, Gottfried Böhm, who was um, an art historian mm -hmm. and a philosopher. He always said about the economic turn. So we agree in Basel, at the university in Basel where I studied, that the power of paintings, of social media, is always much more, um, can I say, overwhelming us than words. Of course, you have association with it. So social media and television, of course, could you imagine exactly last year, people were so shocked and rigid, sort of, that I could answer and reply immediately, yes, of course, mm -hmm. but life must go on. And uh, there were many visual artists, for example, who thought about it, what can we do, how can we represent, for example, our works, and they've done it once again um, by representation, digital tours, and so on. So, um, what gives me hope all the time is that we weren't, let's say, um, in a shock that uh, avoid to go further, to move on. Um, and I think visual art uh, should always be sort of uh, an encouragement. Either you go with me to a guided tour, either do you do it on your own. Um, I think it's always an idea to reflect holistically. And it gives us once again the idea of the intersection. Exactly, exactly. Yes. So what's what's how how do you see the future? Well, first of all, um, I was very happy, honestly glad once again to see that if something like that would happen once again, um, if it had happened once again, we wouldn't be um, let's say um, frustrated. We always will find another solution for it. And I just said that I brought some other uh, artworks of uh, artists, maybe the Gölkase, the Kadaratya, just mm -hmm. to mention. Mm -hmm. That used to be last year, and we had already the COVID, yeah? Remembering the future, for example. So it's nothing to do with the pandemic, pandemic, but he, Kadaratya, the French Algerian artist, yes. born in 1970, that's what he made is, for example, to work with African um, sculptures to represent things like that. Yeah. Hopefully you can see that. Yes, I also the, saw him, his, his work uh, together in, in Kunsthaus. Yes. That's it, yes. yes. And you remember, yes. I think you were quite astonished. I think it is not lovely to see it. No. The first plastic surgery took place at that time. Um, French soldiers in the First World War, they lost um, can I say, the expression of the faces. So, of course, it's not lovely to see them, but it gives us once again, and I think that's what it is, to repair. And that's his idea all the time long. And especially um, to avoid that something will happen once again. Exactly, which is so important. And there you can really also use art to shape public opinion and to try to, to have an impact uh, in which direction we're going and, uh, and also on on, on really raising awareness. And then on the other hand, of course, as we said before, many times before, art is really healing. So I hope, I hope that we can fairly quickly in a safe manner open up even more so that we can again start enjoying culture and, and leading somewhat normal lives. Kerstin, thank you so much for this interview. It's been such a pleasure for me. Thank you, dear, for having me invited. It was a pleasure for me to be here.